Melissa Idris and you're watching The Future is Female, the show where we find the extraordinary in every woman. I'm here on the sidelines of the annual Lead Women uh, Conference. It's called It's Not Okay and uh, the spotlight is on deep-rooted harassment in the workplace and this is something that we'd like to address today because in 2019 it's not okay to have discrimination, bullying and harassment in the workplace. Here with me today I have Anima Kosai, this, um, she's a speaker and writer as well as the founder of the Speak Up movement which empowers people to speak up when it matters. Anima, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Melissa. <laughs> it's really lovely to have you here and I think there's so much I want to talk to you about, especially this, um, as I mentioned, you know, this culture, this deep-rooted culture of uh, harassment in the workplace. We'll touch on that a little bit um, down in the conversation, but let's start with the Speak Up movement. So, it, um, it, it aims to empower people to speak up when it matters. What does that mean and, and how did you come to start it? Well, this is many years on as a, as a lawyer. So I've both been in practice in Malaysia as well as in the corporate world, mainly the oil and gas industry. So one of the things um, as a lawyer, you know, it's like you're very focused on compliance and things that go wrong. And so, and one of the things I noticed is that if, if something wrong happened or something that was unsafe, um, it wouldn't just be one person who's doing something wrong, but there would be people around that person or the situation who knew right. about this wrongdoing or unsafe practice. Um, but what was puzzling was, in some, very often, they'd know, but they'd stay silent. Mm. So I was really curious, what, what's going on here? Because obviously, if something is wrong, you need to bring it up right. to people's attention so they can address it, right? But there'd be this fear, there'd be this silence. And um, I was very I was very perplexed by that. But it wasn't just what I observed personally. I sort of looked around me, and you know, in other country, uh, companies in Malaysia, I'd see similar sort of situations. And then I realized, no, this is not a Malaysian issue. It's worldwide, <laughs> right. right? You know, so I'd look at things like, you know, so one of the first things that happened was, uh, I don't know if you remember the Jimmy Savile case in the UK. In the UK. BBC so this is a celebrity. So when I was a young child growing up there, I used to watch him and think, wow, you know, Bill Cosby, the same, same right. kind of people. And um, after Jimmy Savile died, I think in 2011, suddenly all this news came up that he was a pedophile right. and not only that he'd been sexually assaulting women on his shows because he was uh, top of the pops he was the host um, and there were even allegations of rape but only th this all came out after he died and one of the things that really uh, astonished me was that people high up in BBC mm. who was essentially his bosses they knew right and they did nothing. They said, and there were a lot of witnesses who were kind of aware of his behavior, right. but they kept quiet. And I thought, what's going on here? And of course, you know, today we see, you know, after Weinstein, mm -hmm. all these people who knew but kept quiet. quiet yeah. So I realized that there's a big fear issue going on here, whether we're talking about, in that case, sexual assault, sexual harassment, but also in cases of, the other one I looked at was Volkswagen, Dieselgate. Right. Right? Okay, so it's not just limited to kind of sexual, no. um, okay, sexual no. assault, sexual harassment, it's just wrongdoing in general. Exactly. Even corporate wrongdoing, right? Yes, uh, exactly. And so like in Volkswagen's mm. case, it's fraud, mm. right? And there were people who knew and there was a strong culture of fear in Volkswagen, right from the top coming down. So. People knew, yes, this is wrong, having a cheap device in a car so the regulators don't know what the true CO2 emissions are. Um, but instead, um, there was such a fear that people were afraid that if they said, hey, this is wrong, we should stop it, there'd be retaliation, they'd be out of a job. And this is Germany. We're not even talking about Malaysia. Right. This is the West. <laughs> So, you know, when I looked at Malaysia, um, and I'm, you're probably aware that the power dynamics in Malaysia... Well, are we number one in the power distance ranking or something? Yes. So there is such a distance or deference, I think, when it comes to, you know, the power structure in Malaysia. We're number one. We're number one. So Malaysia Bole, <laughs> but that, that's essentially because... Not the best thing to be proud yeah, of. Yeah, I mean, people, you know, with so many titles and the hierarchy is so strong. Mm. And as young children, we're so, sort of told, obey your elders and never question them. Right. So then when we go into the workplace, we don't question the bosses. So even if the bosses are doing something wrong, and maybe the bosses don't realize they are doing the wrong thing or they're saying the wrong thing because no one challenges them. 
So Speak Up is really, when I first started it um, uh, two years ago after I left my job uh, in the oil and gas industry, um, I was focusing on how do we support the ordinary person in the workplace to speak up when they see wrongdoing. So my whole thing, my holy first was breaking the silence on corporate wrongdoing. So this is really workplace focused. So how do we get people to speak up? And then over time I realized, sure, you can try and encourage people to speak up and build their confidence, but then what? Right. right. So they speak up and then there's this whole, you know, retaliation the on backlash, them and right. the backlash. Mm -hmm. And especially after I moved to the UK, and um, this is when it became really apparent to me because it's 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 bad everywhere. It's not just Malaysia, right? Mm -hmm. And what was going on in the UK? Um, there were a number of organisations, and in healthcare, it's really quite bad, where people would speak up if they saw um, unsafe practices in health in the healthcare in hospitals and so on, okay. and they were getting backlashed. So I knew I know people personally who I who I've been working with as well who got fired from hospitals for and speaking so up about safety practices. Yeah. Okay. Or unsafe practices. Okay. Exactly. So, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the doctor was making a wrong call or something okay. like that. And unfortunately, the, the backlash was very severe. Mm. So it's like, oh, better just to keep quiet or you lose your right. job. The fear. The fear. So then I realized, hang on, I can't just be focusing on why aren't people fo uh, speaking up. I need to look at, well, is anyone listening? So, you know, there's a speak up and then there's a listening element. And right in the middle is this space, right? which I call sort of safe space. So is the workplace, that environment, conducive for people to raise issues knowing they will be heard, right, and supported? Mm. Because my whole, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm coming from a place of how do we stop wrongdoing? Because mm. I'm looking at preventive rather than, you know, the typical lawyer thing like, okay, it's happened now, how do we how punish do we, people right, and, right. and investigate? But my thing is like, you know what, we can stop it really early on. And it's the moment the first person says, hang on, that's not quite right. And so it's really about raising it at that point. Okay, all right, so let's touch on that. The, the hang on, this is not quite right. And yeah. I'd I like to focus in the workplace. And I know there's many types of wrongdoings in the workplace, but if we could uh, perhaps look at harassment, which is something that affects men and women, yep. but women more so fear the repercussions, perhaps um, lack the courage or the are fearful to speak up. Um, let's focus on harassment, Anima. Um, if we could get granular, or actually if we could just define it first, because I thought about this and I thought, well, what constitutes harassment? Do I even understand what behaviour is harassment and what is not? Could you help refine it for us? You know, I, love, I love that question <laughs> because I think, you know, so you asking what is it, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, it, it's really like the moment, you, let's say you're at work, right? And something, you know, somebody says something and you feel, Ugh, or like, oh, I feel, I feel a little bit afraid okay. or I'm not comfortable with that. That sort of initial reaction in your gut mm -hmm. is telling you something is wrong. Um, and therefore that her, you're in a situation where you're being harassed but a lot of us don't recognize it because we got so used to it so you know when I first joined the workforce some years ago right this is in the 90s and um, I thought it was normal to be shouted at I thought it was normal to you know for someone to throw a file across the room and say you know anima that that work is terrible um, you know what I was told so you know, as young lawyers we write legal opinions and this is what I was told your legal opinion is worse than toilet paper. Oh, wow. And as a young lawyer, you're just out of law school, you've been called up to the bar, and you hear this, and it's like, you know, you start off being confident, but then over time, when you hear this over and over again, you lose confidence, and it, it, it sort of, your self-esteem just falls. And I suffered this kind of thing for two years, by which time I was like a wreck. I wanted to leave practice, I, you know, on Sundays uh, before, you know, Sunday nights, I could feel these knots in my stomach. Stress, because oh. you know you're heading back into that toxic yeah. environment. I would sit in the car and, and this, this, I was holding my hands like this. Okay. So, clenched because so I was so scared. That would be considered harassment, but you didn't realize that it was. I didn't. I thought that's because I was a, a, a young person at that time. And I thought, well, you know what? This is what being in legal practice is like. That's often what we hear, right? This is, and, and I, my experience is that this is the newsroom. This is the yeah. school of hard knocks. You have to go yeah. through, this is paying your dues. 
Um, and if we don't, we're not hard on you when you're young, how are you going to learn? Yeah, because you know what I was told? Oh, all lawyers have to go through this because how are you going to be stand up before a judge who's right. being tough on you? So I took it as, oh, well, this is my training. This is for me to toughen up. Mm. So it's almost like it was normalized and I justified it. And I rationalized as to why it was acceptable to me because it would make me a better lawyer. Right. So is there a certain level of severity, um, Anima, before it becomes harassment or is it just that feeling when you know I'm not comfortable with this kind of behaviour in the workplace? Okay. Well, well, the feeling is, is your red flag, your oh, okay. own internal All red right. flag. So if we look at harassment itself, I mean harassment it, by its very nature is not one-off. It tends to be repetitive. Oh, okay. So like I said, you know, every day something might happen. Right. Um, and so if, you know, if someone just tells you, insults you once, you're like, mm, you know, but if you're getting it every day, it really affects you. So harassment tends to be repetitive. But if it's really serious, like, you know, if someone were to, you know, come and grab and kiss me or something like that, I mean, that may that's be a, a one-off, but assault. that's serious. Right, yes, yes. That's, that's assault often. Actually, so that is, yeah. We can, we can kind of use that as a red flag, but it really is more difficult to kind of pinpoint the harassment because the conversation around harassment has always been, is that harassment? Is that harassing behaviour? Yeah. And I often find myself at a loss at how to have these conversations and say, well, if it made the other person uncomfortable, yes. it is it is enough it is. to consider that harassment. And even if both of us feel like it's not comfortable, someone else watching might cons might might take offence, right? Absolutely. So if we look at the definition of harassment, so you might find it in policies, you often find it, we don't have a law in this country actually. No. Um, yet. Hopefully. Yet. <laughs> uh, Hopefully. But, uh, in, in, in some other countries, uh, particularly in Western countries, there are laws and, and they could be inequality type laws, mm -hmm. non-discriminatory laws or actual workplace bullying laws. They have that in, in some of the US states have that okay. as well. And so harassment, the, the traditional definition there's two parts of it right so the first part is that someone does uh, an act which is um, makes a person feel humiliated uncomfortable offended um, so it's if this is about how it makes a person feel right mm -hmm. actually the intention is is not really the element the intention is not the element, it's, it, it's how the person, the person receives feels, it. Okay. Exactly, okay. how the person receives okay. it. So you said humiliated, offended, um, uncomfortable, uncomfortable, afraid. Okay. You know, so if, if, if um, I remember once uh, um, looking at a case where a manager said to a secretary, um, if you're not careful, there'll be an ambulance waiting for you downstairs. That's a so threat. that's a Yes, exactly. And of course, when question, well, yeah, maybe she's not well, or you know, they'll always. Oh, there's a way around. So there's a statement that you can read it in several ways, and often someone who harasses will say, "Oh, I didn't intend it. This is what I meant." But the person listening goes, "Did you just threaten me? I'm going to feel really unsafe when I walk out the office today." I understand. Like, are you waiting for me? <laughs> so that's one. And the second part of it, um, and these are two distinct things. They don't have to happen together. Is whether that action creates a hostile work environment which you know where the the, the people in the office mm. will feel afraid uncomfortable and they don't feel empowered mm. to to speak up or be themselves all right we're going to continue this conversation in just a couple of minutes make sure you stay tuned to the future is female we'll be right back back to The Future is Female. I'm Melissa Idris and I'm chatting to Anima Kosai who is the founder of the Speak Up movement. We're here on the sidelines of the Lead Women Annual Conference titled or called It's Not Okay. We're discussing creating safe workspace um, here in 2019. This, is, this should be a given. <laughs> Anima, let's uh, come back to the issue of harassment in the workplace as we were talking about just before the break. Um, what are some of the root causes? I mean, this is kind of natural or, or this kind of seems to be human behavior to discriminate or is, is it 
to do with culture of a workplace and culture of upbringing? What do you think? Well, it's a mix of everything. Um, uh, there, there's several factors, right? One of them is that the culture of the work environment all around the world has been very much, you know, after the Industrial Revolution, right, hundreds of years ago, it's been about performance and targets. Mm -hmm. So there's this incredible pressure, and every year it increases, especially in big companies that need to, you know, every, you know, every quarter they right. issue certain reports, targets, exactly. so these shareholders, and they, they they address the analysts. It goes out in the news, mm. and their stock is 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 uh, based on how they perform this. correct and with those targets as you go further down you know from the board to the c-suite to the middle management right to the ground there are all these different targets so everybody is very pressured to perform mm. and when people are so focused on targets and we talked about Volkswagen right yes. I mean one of the targets was that Volkswagen would be number one car manufacturer in the world oh. right so because they were they weren't quite up there yet and to be number one it meant they had to dominate the US market which was tough because they were behind the Japanese and mm. the other American mm. manufacturers so it meant that they had to do, have a car that was clean mm -hmm. <laughs> decent, well environmentally clean and affordable for the ordinary American citizen but this was impossible to do to have an engine that could fit in there with all the catalytic converters and this is why they cheated Right. Now, there was this pressure actually on the, the workforce that they had to meet this target and essentially the message was, well, if you can't do it, we'll find someone else to do it. So can you imagine the engineers under that pressure? Right. So um, that's one example and that's where there was some fraud going on. But this cuts across the board. There are other shortcuts. You know, some organizations may take shortcuts on safety mm. measures mm. in order to hit deadlines. Right or in order to meet the, the budget. Okay, all right. But you know, all this anima, this kind of wrongdoing okay. at the workplace, all the harassment at the workplace, it also impacts the company's bottom line, yes, it doesn't does. it? Because if you're talking about just high pressure performance and you know, um, meeting targets, if you, I mean, Volkswagen is a perfect example, but also all the other companies you know, who have suffered brand reputation from sexual harassment cases, you know, having to pay out settlements, that's millions of dollars sometimes, that also impacts the bottom line. It does, if they're caught. <laughs> oh, if, if they're caught, that's a good so point. So I think when people are making these decisions because they're pressured, oh, well, I'll do this. And, and, and so there's, the, there's that pressure in itself is harassment. Okay. And one of the things that we did in the conference is we saw examples that were acted out for us where bosses, they were so pressured that they were yelling and screaming at their people, we've got to get this done, we've got to deliver, the client wants this. And there was also situations where late at night, you know, the boss was WhatsApping the rest right. of the group yep. and saying, you know, I don't care how you do it, just get it done, yeah. right? And, you know, even I've said that, uh, I don't care how you do it, just get it done. And I was watching that and going, oh my God, right? Because sometimes when you're the boss, you've got so many things to think about. But this is old style leadership. And you know, as, as bosses, one of the things we need to do is be aware of the pressures, but not start pushing our people until they literally almost keel over with heart attacks right. and that sort of thing. So, because harassment, a lot of it is coming from the incredible high pressure within organizations. So we gave you is, know, that is there are, are women more affected by it? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I know it happens across the board, but but is there a, a you know a specific impact that women take harder? Well, um, both do, okay. and I think women are probably more affected when it comes to sexual harassment, okay. definitely. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a factor. When it comes to general harassment like bullying and pressure, I think both genders kind of get it in equal me right. measures. And both women and men are harassers as well. Mm. So, okay. so that's the... So it goes that, both ways. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, but what comes into play? That's the power dynamics, right? Yes. Okay. So it's also interesting that you mentioned women because one of the things that we're seeing, and there is actually literature on this, mm. and Patty Perez, who's also part of the conference, she says one of the root causes of harassment is the lack of diversity at a higher level, at the leadership level. So if you look at boards, and we look at you know, the top management, the CEOs and so on, um, they're mainly men. Mm. in today's age, right? Mm. But when you have diversity in terms of genders, you have more of a balance between men and women at the higher levels. 
What you also see is because diversity means there's a challenge to the standard way of thinking. So women are more likely to challenge, you know, the traditional male thinking of deliver da, 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 at whatever cost. Um, sometimes women are more likely to bring the human factor to the fore, like, oh, well, have we considered what this does to our employees and their families? Okay. Um, or, you know, how are people feeling about this? So, so that's it's important to have exactly. that difference of, of voice. Exactly. Anyway, if I could uh, move the conversation to the retaliation or the backlash. We spoke a little bit about what happens when someone speaks up, right? So sometimes there is, you know, repercussions for doing that. And one of the conversations that I've lately found myself having and have difficulty in having this discourse is victim blaming. Oh, this yeah. often comes out and, and I often find myself at a loss of how to respond when someone victim blames um, the, the person who comes out and speaks up and raises their hand and says, I'm not comfortable with this. How would you respond? Well, we should, this very fact that we're having this conversation is important and we need to recognise when victim blaming is happening. Okay. Sometimes the person who raises the issue and then, you know, let's say sexual harassment and say, I was sexually harassed and they report it. But the other thing is they're also looking, they blame themselves. Mm. So when people, as a result of victim blaming and a victim starts blaming him or herself, mm -hmm. then he or she is less likely to report it. And this behavior continues, that's one. Um, the other thing is um, when HR is part of this problem very often, unfortunately, and the leaders. Um, because they're so uncomfortable when someone comes forward and reports something, particularly if it's harassment, because it's about behavior. And if the report is against someone senior in the organization, right? Um, unfortunately, HR and management tend to, for some reason, want to protect this person right. as opposed to the person reporting it. And that's why retaliation happens because they could be asking questions, are you sure that happened? And right. there's this disbelief. Mm. And one of the things that we're learning is that when someone speaks up on harassment and reports, I've been harassed, the overwhelming desire is to be heard, acknowledged and believed. And a Me Too has been doing that, right? Mm. I mean, suddenly mm. we hear these voices. But unfortunately, in many workplaces, there's still that tendency to like, are you sure? Or oh, that was nothing. You're, you're right. oversensitive. There's something wrong with you. Instead of looking at the, the behavior, which is toxic. Mm. So that's, that's, we need to shift that. That conversation, I completely agree. And, yeah. I, and I think this comes back again to the conversation that we had earlier about the power dynamic, about you know, this fixation on targets and performance that you often protect someone who is seen to be of authority or oh, is bringing champion, in the money. Bringing in the money, that's right. Uh, Anima, in the few minutes that we have left, uh, and you know, for those watching today, where can we learn more about this? If we want to empower ourselves to understand harassment, what is and is not acceptable, how to have those conversations so that we're not contributing to this bad behavior, the bad culture, wrongdoing, what, where can we go to learn more? You, I can promote myself. Right? Well, yeah, well, do, do you? I mean, I'm constantly um, talking about this. Um, so, you know, I mean, I'm on social media, both Twitter and LinkedIn, um, and uh, I write a lot and do speak about mm. issues surrounding this whole speak up culture and what we need to do. How do we create safe spaces mm. uh, in organizations? So I've written it, at it, you know, from a sexual harassment perspective, a fraud perspective, um, even money laundering right. as well, okay. you know, uh, which happens. Because, because that's to do with the culture of people not saying, yes. not speaking up when they see yes. something wrong. And because the banks also need to have a safe space where officers can okay. raise issues without feeling, you know. Oh, I'm going to flash your Twitter okay. handle oh, on the screen <laughs> uh, so that you can also follow Anima. Just to get ourselves more, I guess, to level up our, our knowledge when it comes to having conversations about this. Um, on that final note, what would you like people to take away from our conversation today? And also just from the conference today, if you could distill it, I mean, it's a tough order, but um, how, what, what kind of concrete takeaway would you like those watching today to go away with? Well, all of us know when mm. something's wrong. As I said, you feel it in your gut. Right. So if it's happening to you, know that it's wrong and know that it's not your fault. That's one. 
right? The second one is if you see someone else do something that's harassing behavior, don't be a you know bystander, silent bystander and just sort of keep quiet, but say something, mm -hmm. especially if you're in a position where you can do so, where it's safe to intervene, do it. Um, and the best thing is if you see someone being harassed, ask them, are you okay? And offer support. That's so meaningful okay. to them. To be heard. Right? Yes. And then make it clear to the person who's harassing, this is unacceptable. This is not behavior we want to see in our organization. I love yeah. that. I, my takeaway from this, Anima, has been I'm going to speak up when I see oh, something wrong. Oh, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have on The Future is Female. I'm Melissa Idris and I will be back with you same time next week speaking to other extraordinary women. I'll catch you then.